moment, an event that forever altered the course of race relations in America. As our image reveals itself, the 1957 school year is about to begin, and an angry mob is trying to stop nine black students from entering Central High in Little Rock, Arkansas. The question I usually get asked is, were we scared? I think initially, uh, we didn't anticipate clearly all of the violence and turmoil uh, that occurred. The first day that we attempted to go to school, eight of us were at one part of the school and Elizabeth Eckford was at another part. And it was the mob that followed Elizabeth. Then you begin to feel that uh, uh, this was a very hostile, violent uh, group of people. Even at that point, I told myself that if we didn't go through with it, didn't uh, attend Central and backed out, it would just reinforce uh, the view that the African-American community in Little Rock wasn't interested in uh, making a change in things. During the 1950s, African Americans throughout the country were trying to make their voices heard. We, the Negro citizens of Montgomery, Alabama, do now and will continue to carry on our mass protest. The driver demanded that I give this beat up a uh, white man. I didn't feel that I was being treated as a human being. I refused to give up this speed. I said no. Little Rock was a year after the Montgomery bus boycott. So we had seen uh, the impact of, uh, of Rosa Parks and uh, the beginning of Dr. King's career and uh, knew that things could change. All in favor, let it be known by standing on your feet. The first step for the Little Rock Nine came in May, 1954 when the U.S. Supreme Court issued its opinion in the landmark case, Brown versus the Topeka, Kansas Board of Education. Separate but equal was inherently unequal, and integration was now the law of the land. In 1957, this decision and the power of the federal government were tested in Little Rock, Arkansas. We didn't, at the moment we were selected, have any idea it was going to be as difficult as it turned out to be. In the face of protests at Central High School, the governor of Arkansas, Orville Favis, calls out the National Guard. His official reasoning is to preserve the peace and prevent violence. Oh, it wasn't, clearly wasn't to protect us. It was to make a symbolic stand. It was to protect the way of life uh, in the South, because they barred our entrance. Hoping to throw open these school doors, President Dwight Eisenhower does the unprecedented. He calls in the 101st Airborne Division of the U.S. Army. I think President Eisenhower wanted to show that the federal government was supreme in this. And they could have done what they needed to do with, with 100 troops. But 1,000 paratroopers was really meant to send a message. Under the guard of the U.S. Army, the students are finally able to do something seemingly very simple, go to school. But it would not be easy for Ernest Green or his eight fellow black students. School was like going to war every day. The walks from class to class were where, you know, you had a lot of harassment, uh, a lot of physical violence. But Ernest Green persevered becoming the first black graduate of Central High School with the class of 1958. Green would eventually go on to a successful banking career and government service in the Carter administration. But in 1958, integration was not complete in Little Rock. The following year, Governor Faubus closed all public schools in Arkansas instead of complying with desegregation. Schools in Arkansas would not be fully integrated until 1972. Yet, the world would always remember these nine students, 
who, by claiming their place in the classroom, were claiming their place in history. Attending Central was special in the sense that it was part of history. Uh, it was part of a change. This was reverberating all over the country, all over the world. Ernest Green wasn't the only member of the Little Rock Nine to make a name for himself. What happened to the rest? Well, one's a magazine publisher, another a social worker. There's also a teacher, a realtor, two writers, an accountant, and a clinical psychologist. Seems they did pretty well, all things being equal. For the History Channel, I'm Mike Rowe. 